this is the part two of this series that I'm doing on the covenant, whom he calls. And I want to, you know, is the subject of God's covenant important to you? I want to ask that question. Is the subject of God's covenant important to you? Is it, or is it just some sort of esoteric theological argument or a thought or a doctrine that's really kind of twiggy? It's out there in the twigs and it's not the trunk of the tree. It's not the core of the issues about what your salvation is all about. Is that what you think? You know, there are many Protestants that preach that the, you know, salvation is very simple. In fact, sometimes it could even simpl it'd be simplistic. Just believe on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. I mean, pick up that gospel track, you know, read that little thing, go to a quiet place, you know, say this, whatever, and believe in your heart, you know, this is heart, not my stomach. Believe in your heart, you know, that you, you've, you've done these things and you have that assurance, you know, that you're saved or respond at an evangelistic campaign. Go down there for that altar call and, and say, I accept Christ as my Savior, you know, and, and that's, is, is that it? Is that what it takes for your salvation? Is, is, that all, is that really all there is to it? Oh, yeah, and maybe after you're saved, yeah, they, they will have, many of the churches will say, well, by the way, you know, you, you really, you know, you should show up to church on occasion, you know, especially Christmas and Easter and and don't forget to leave a little something in the basket, by the way, while you're doing that. And so as long as you feel emotionally charged and fuzzy and warm, you know, you know you're going with the good people up to heaven. Is that what salvation is really all about? Is that, is that what Christianity is about? Or is there something more to it? Is there something? What do the scriptures really say? Well, let's take a look here. Let's just, uh, let's be fair here. Let's go to Romans 10 and verse 9, okay? And I'll read this in the NIV, the New International Version, which is uh, one of the favorite versions of the evangelistic uh, churches. Uh, Romans 10 and verse 9 says this, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay, that seems simple enough. Declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe with your heart that uh, God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. Sounds simple. Then uh, let's go to Mark chapter 16, verse 10. Mark actually adds a little more um, in here. Mark actually is uh, chapter 16, verse 16. It says here, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Okay, so it's adding an extra, a little something here. You've got to be baptized as well as believing, okay? But you will be saved. So that seems fairly simple, okay? To be a Christian, just believe and be baptized and you're saved. That's all there is to it. Let's take another look at another rather famous uh, selection of verses. Let's just go to Acts chapter 16 and verse 25. And I'm going to read, still, I'm still in the NIV. Uh, Acts chapter 16 and verse 25. And I'm going to read here a little bit longer passage. The first two, it seems to sound fairly simple. Acts chapter 16 and verse 25 says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Okay, they weren't just doing this. Uh, this was about midnight they're doing this. And the reason why they're doing it, about, we'll find out here in just a second. And the other prisoners were listening to them. You see, they were in jail. Verse 26, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken and all at once the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Yeah, Paul and Silas had been chained up. They'd been put in stocks fast inside the prison. Verse 27, the jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. The Greco-Roman world, a, pris uh, a jailer was responsible personally with his own head for the security and, and hanging on to the prisoners that were entrusted in his care. And if one got loose, he paid for it with his life. So he, was, he, he thought with this earthquake, he thought they would all, you know, flew the coop. And he figured he would just <laughs> do himself in rather than be tortured first and then have his head cut off. Great, great bunch, these Romans. Anyways, verse 28 but Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Okay, straightforward question. 
And they replied, Paul and Silas replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Is that all there was to it? What did Paul mean by this? Verse 32, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. That one little sentence, there's a lot in there. There's a lot in there. This is the middle of the night. You know, Paul and Silas preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to this jailer, just as they had been doing to all those other people in Macedonia and the city of Philippi where they were visiting, where they had been all of a sudden in the middle of the, their, their campaign that they had, in the middle of their preaching, they'd been, they'd been rounded up by a mob and hauled before the Roman magistrates and beaten to an inch of their life with rods and then thrust into this jail. Now, before that had happened, for days, while Paul was going up to the city, there was this woman who'd had an, uh, an evil spirit, a spirit of divination, okay? And her, the, the, she was a slave, and she was owned, and her masters made a lot of money. She was a fortune teller of her of time, and she used to follow behind Paul and Silas when they were going around and talking to people. And they, she would yell out, These men are the servants of the Most High God and are preaching to us the way of salvation. This went on for days. <laughs> yeah, could you imagine walking around and there's always somebody behind you, you know, sort of trumpeting. You know, maybe the first couple of days you would have thought, hey, this is good, it'll, it'll draw the crowd. But after a while, you know, just, obviously it started to get to be old for Paul because he finally turned around and told the spirit to get out. In the name of Jesus Christ, leave this woman. And the spirit had to obey. But when her, her master saw that she didn't have the spirit and they could no longer sell her fortune-telling abilities, they were upset. Money was involved. And that's when Paul and Silas had gotten beaten. Well, the jailer would have known about this because, you know, in a small town, this goes on. <laughs> yeah, and it would have been big news, actually, of all this sort of stuff. Verse 33, going back to our text, verse 33. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. The first thing he did, he got them out, and after he'd heard the gospel being preached to him, he took their wounds. His response was to take their wounds. He saw their needs, and immediately he and his whole household were baptized. In verse 34, and the jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them, because they were probably quite hungry. He was filled with joy, because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole household. He had come to believe in God because he had seen this incredible miracle, the shaking of the prison, the releasing of all their chains and the stocks that they were held fast. And he had heard about these things and he, and he had had his life spared. Paul had had that compassion. They just didn't up and split. They knew what the rules were, that society of that time, and they'd, they'd saved his life. But you know, before Paul and Silas left, they would have told them about the other people in, this, in the town of Philippi who were meeting on a regular basis to get together to pray. People who had been longtime believers in the scriptures. And this jailer and his family would have continued on in the admonition and in instruction and in growth in the way of God. So is salvation achieved all at once? Is it a one-time feeling of belief? You know, accompanied by uh, an oral confession that Jesus is a Christ and then baptism? Or is, is, you know, is that all there is to it? Is that all that is required? Or is there something more? Is it just once saved and always saved? And then you can just, you know, once you've made your profession of faith and said, I accept Christ and this sort of thing, then you can go about doing your thing, whatever it might be, because you're always saved and you just go ahead. Well, the Apostle Paul actually clarifies this issue for us. We don't have to guess. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we'll go to verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. I'm going to read this in the English Standard Version, the ESV. Paul says this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, or as the Holman Christian Standard Bible puts it, I want to clarify for you the gospel I proclaim to you, which you received in your, uh, in which you stand, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. 
This is the present progressive. You are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Or as the Holman Christian Standard Bible puts it, to no purpose. Yeah, you can perhaps believe to no purpose. You can believe in vain. I would remind you now, brothers, the gospel I preach to you, which you received and which you now stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Being saved here, the Greek word is, uh, it's, it's here if you're looking up in your Strong's, 4982. So, Dizo, properly, it's to deliver out of danger, to deliver out of danger and bring into safety. It's used principally, of course, in the scriptures of God rescuing the believers from the penalty and power of sin and bringing people into God's provisions, into God's safety. What is this? Let's go to 2 Corinthians. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. Let's take another let's a little more look at this as Paul clarifies the issue. Yes, by which you are being saved if you hold fast. Now in 2 Corinthians 2 and in verse 12, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 12, I want to read this in the Casier translation. Casier is a New Covenant translation. Now this is what happened when I came to Troas. Okay, another city there in Asia Minor. Meaning to preach the gospel which tells us of Christ. There did I indeed open up before me the most promising prospect of laboring for the Lord's cause. Verse 13, still, failing as I did in my efforts to find my brother Titus, there was no resting for my spirit. And thus I did, after all, take leave of the men there and went to Macedonia. Verse 14, but thanks be to God who made us one with Christ, is ever carrying us captive in his triumphal procession, and who through us is making manifest over all the world what sweet Savior there is, what sweet Savior there is in having knowledge of God. Paul is drawing an image here, a word picture, that being one with Christ, that we're walking, that we're walking with Christ in a triumphal procession, just like the Romans would take. They would take their prisoners and those who had fought with them, and they'd go in triumphal procession up to the king, to the, to the chief leader. And he's saying, that this was a, that there is in this, in this procession, there is a sweet savior. There's a sweet smell that comes from having the knowledge of God. Verse 15, for we are, and Christ made us such, a fragrance offered up to God. And that is what we are, both to those who are in the way of salvation, which many versions will translate being saved, for those who are in the way of salvation and to those who are on the way to perdition, or as other translations will put it, who are perishing, who are being saved or who are perishing in the way of salvation or on the way to perdition. It is, again, this present progressive. It's like you're, you're walking with Christ in this procession on the way to salvation. It's a lifetime walk. But those who aren't walking with Christ on the way to salvation are walking on the way to perdition, the way to being lost, the way to perishing. Verse 16, being to the latter, to the, that is those who are perishing, a savior arising from death and leading to death. Yes, Christianity to those who aren't involved, to those who reject it, to those who look away from it. Yeah, a Christian, we smell like death to them. We smell like death to them because they're on the way of perdition. They're on the way of being lost, of being destroyed. But to the former, that is, who are being saved, a savor arising from life and leading to life. And who is worthy of such a calling? 
Who indeed? Yeah, who's worth, who is indeed is worth this calling to march with Christ on the way of salvation? Who's worthy of that? Who indeed? Verse 17, still as for ourselves, at least, we do not, as many others do, deal with the word of God like hawkers offering their wares. Yeah, like you can turn on Sunday morning, you can hear a lot of people hawking their religious wares. No, we proclaim it with complete sincerity. We proclaim it as it comes to us straight from God. All enveloped in Christ, we proclaim it in the very sight of God. Amen. Yeah, that's what, what Paul wrote is, is, is the way it should be. Who is worthy of such a calling? We are being saved. We're in the way of salvation. We are being made one with Christ as we continue growing in his grace and knowledge. Let's go to Hebrews 3, verse 1. <clears throat> Hebrews 3 and verse 1. And I'm going to read this one in the, the Coulter translation. Hebrews 3 and verse 1. Okay. Because of this, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of the faith we profess, Jesus Christ, who is faithful to him who appointed him, even as Moses was in all his house. For he has been counted worthy of greater glory than Moses, even as he who built the house has so much more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. It is God who is building his house. Now, on, the other, on one hand, Moses was faithful in all his house as a ministering servant, for testimony of those things which were going to be spoken afterwards. But on the other hand, Christ was faithful as a son. As a son. Christ was faithful as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we are truly holding fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. It's not once saved, always saved. But we are in a way, we are in the route, we are in the way of salvation. This is something that is, and we can go verse 14, he reemphasizes in this chapter. I believe this is Paul. It was sent to this particular epistle, which was delivered into the hand of Timothy, and he actually delivered it to the Hebrews. And Timothy, as you know, was one of the close workers with Paul. But anyways, it says here in Hebrews 3 and verse 14, For we are companions of Christ if we truly hold the confidence that we had at the beginning steadfast unto the end. It would seem very clear from what the Apostle Paul is talking about that it's not once saved, always saved. That it's something we have to continue in. It's something we must go on and, and do. Let's go to 2 Peter. Let's go to the general epistle of the Apostle Peter. <clears throat> 2 Peter, chapter 2, excuse me, uh, 2 Peter, chapter 3, and verse uh, 14. 2 Peter 3 and verse 14. For this reason, beloved, since you are anticipating these things, be diligent so that you may be found in him in peace, spotless, and blameless. Since we're anticipating the future promises, because he's, what he's talking about here immediately before is a promise of what's coming. It's the prophetic of the new heavens and the new earth and all the things in the new Jerusalem. Since we have these things and we have knowledge of these things of what's coming, he's saying, and since we're anticipating these things, he's saying, be diligent, be diligent so that you may be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. Sounds like we have to be, you know, intent on our walk. We have to be really 
uh, conscious in this walk of salvation. Verse 15, and bear in mind that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Yeah, God's patience is salvation. It's our deliverance. Exactly as our brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has also written to you, as he has also in all his epistles speaking to them concerning these things, in which are some things that are difficult to understand, which the ignorant and unstable are twisting and distorting, as they also twist and distort the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. Having a simplistic approach to this walk, this, 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 to those of us who are walking in this way of salvation, to those of us who want to seek God, who want to inherit what he's promised, who want to live this way of life, it it, simplicity is, you know, it's, it's one thing, simplicity can be love, but it's not, the scriptures and Christianity is not simplistic. It's just not a shallow confessing the name of Christ with your mouth and saying you believe and that's all you have to do for your salvation. That is being simplistic. You're twisting and distorting the message of the scriptures. Verse 17, therefore, beloved, since you know this in advance, be on guard against such practices, lest you be led away with the error of the lawless ones, the error of those that are out of the standards, those who are not living according to the instructions that God is teaching his people. That's why we have a Bible. The Bible is just not one page. If it was just, well, you say you believe and, and you can just, just go ahead and get wet, be baptized, and you're saved, if that's all there is to it, then why do we have all these pages? What's it all about? Lest you be led astray with the error of the lawless ones and you fall from your own steadfastness, rather be growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter is saying that we must be growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. And he closes that to him be glory both now and into the days of eternity. Amen. This is something that we're be growing. Is an understanding of God's covenant an essential part to growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Let's go to Matthew chapter 26. Again, as asked in the beginning, you know, why is it important for us to understand the nature of the covenant? Why is it important to you? If we go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 26, and verse 26, I'll read this in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Matthew 26, 26. Yes, it is an understanding of God's covenant and an essential part of growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, let's see. What did Jesus say? Matthew 26, verse 26, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread. He blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you. Okay, some, some versions will put it, drink all of it, you know, this type of thing. But what it's called for is everyone's participation. Everyone in that room, everyone at that table, they were all to drink from the wine. Verse 28, why? For this is my blood that establishes the new covenant. This is my blood that brings it into force, that establishes the new covenant here, because the Holman Christian Standard Bible translates this. It is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. It is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. The New Living Translation puts it this way in verse 27, and he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. You know, it's interesting here, this confirms the covenant. The Greek word for new, 
here. You'll, in some versions, we'll say this is uh, drinks because it confirms the new covenant here in, um, in Matthew. It's not found in the oldest of the manuscripts that we have that is preserved. It's not found in the third century papyri, which is some of the, the oldest of the gospels that we have. It's not in, found in the fourth century uh, manuscripts uh, like Codex Sinaiticus or Codex uh, Vaticanaticus, you know, whatever. It's, it's not in there in those particular ones. It's just, this is for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant. In Mark 14, Mark chapter 14 and verse 24, which is, it's interesting. Uh, Mark 14, verse 24, again, I'm reading here in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. In 24, he said, He said to them, This is my blood that establishes the covenant. It is shed for many. Because Matthew and Mark, both of them in here, the oldest manuscripts, is just talk about the covenant. It doesn't even have the word kene in there, kenos, for, for new. It's only in Luke that we start to see this. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 20, again in Holman, Christian Standard Bible in verse 20, that's Luke 22 and verse 20. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant established by my blood. It is shed for you. Only here in Luke 22 verse 20 do we have this reference to Cana, to new in here. It's very interesting. The other versions just were referring, the oldest of the text, we're just talking, this is, this, we're establishing the covenant with this blood. Now let's go to Hebrews 13, Hebrews 13. And I want to read this one in the Coulter, in the Coulter translations, Hebrews 13 and verse 20. See something about the nature of this covenant. And may the God of peace who raised our Lord Jesus from among the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, talking of Jesus, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, perfects you in every good work in order that you may do his will, accomplishing in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory into the ages of eternity. So it's through this blood of the everlasting covenant, in verse 21, the point is, is to perfect you in every good work in order that you may do His will, accomplishing in you which He is going to be doing that which is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ. Interesting here in the, the word in the Greek for everlasting is aheoneos. It's uh, your Strong's uh, 166. And it means the age long covenant, the eternal covenant. Figuratively, there is a unique quality, a reality of God's life that's, it's, that's at work in the believer. It's this age long, this eternal covenant that's at work among the people of God. You know, this is an interesting phrase. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, it recalls directly what God Almighty said to Abraham in Genesis 17, 7, where, and I'll read this in the English Standard Version, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout your generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. The everlasting covenant here in the Hebrew is Strong's 50, 57, 69, it's Olam. So it's something that's of a long duration. It implies both antiquity and, futu and futurity. Because what it's looking at, what's very interesting, the, the image here in Hebrew is sort of like a vanishing point. If you're looking at a line that stretches out into the future until it disappears from view, or stretching out into the past and something that stretches out and disappears from view. It is this continuous, this longest imaginable type of thing. They're talking about this everlasting covenant that God was establishing with Abraham and for his seed that was after him. This idea of the covenant was something that was 
that we can obviously see is both in what we now call the New Covenant and that which we call the Old Covenant. And that which was before, and the prophets prophesied of that which was going to be in the future. If we go to Zechariah chapter 9, let's go to Zechariah chapter 9. I'm going to read this. Prophet Zechariah chapter 9. In fact, uh, in a lot of churches coming up uh, soon, they're going to be singing uh, some of these words and the Messiah. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes to you. He is triumphant and victorious, yet meek and riding on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a donkey. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and, which was like an implement, you know, a vehicle of war, and the horse from Jerusalem. Horses were mostly used for military purposes in the ancient world. And the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. And his dominion shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. You also, by the blood of your covenant, I have freed your prisoners out of the pit in which there was no water. By the blood of the covenant, he's saying he is going to free the people who in throwing into a pit without water, that means they have a certain death, and rel relatively quickly. Then there's this admission, turn to the stronghold, prisoners of hope. Even today I do declare that I shall restore double to you. Brethren, this is a, a fascinating. In, in talking about the, here is a prophecy of what Christ was coming. He was coming, and it, because of the covenant, he was going to deliver the people who were otherwise without hope. It was something by the blood of the covenant that they were and would have a call upon God to hear them and to help them and to remember them. We go to Isaiah chapter 42. Let's go to Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah chapter 42. And prophecy of, of, of Christ's, Christ's ministry and what he was seeking to accomplish. Isaiah chapter 42, and I'll start reading in verse 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth justice to the Gentiles. So here he's talking about his servant who is going to bring, it wasn't just to the family of Abraham, it was to all humanity was the goal. This was the purpose. And he shall not cry out nor lift up, nor shall he cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he shall not break, and a smoking wick he shall not quench. In truth, he shall bring forth justice. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, until he has set justice in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. These are some of the prime purposes that the Messiah was going to accomplish. These are the things that he had in mind. He has a goal. Jesus has a goal. Things he wants to accomplish. Verse 5, thus the, says the Lord God, he who created the heavens and stretched them out, spreading forth the earth and its offspring, he who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand and will keep you and give you for a covenant of the people to be a light to the Gentiles. See, God was giving him as a covenant, as a way of life that he was going to establish with humanity to open, verse 7, the eyes of the blind. It could be talking figuratively as well as literally. To bring out the prisoners from the prison. You're recalling Zechariah 9. Those who sit in darkness out of the prison house. Just like he pulled, sending his, probably his angel, to shake that prison to free Paul and Silas out from the stocks that were about their feet and the chains that were on their hands. These were things 
He was, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand and will keep you and give you for a covenant for the people. There is an important reason why we study the covenant. It is the covenant that's made in Christ's blood. It is part, is it, is, is it just a twiggy aspect of theology? Or is the trunk of the tree of what God is getting to? What are the consequences if we misunderstand or ignore or disdain or reject God's covenant? Is there a consequence? Well, let's see. Let's go to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, on the other end of your Bible. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 29. I'm going to read this one in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Hebrews 10, verse 29. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way. How much worse punishment do you think one will deserve who has trampled on the Son of God, regarded as profane the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and insulted the Spirit of grace? Wow. Yeah, there's a cost. There's a cost to misunderstanding or, or being ignorant or disdaining somehow in rejecting God's covenant. Insulting, it says here the writer of Hebrews, even the spirit of grace. Verse 30, for we know the one who has said, vengeance belongs to me, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The covenant is very important to the people of God. It is something that takes, it's, it's not peripheral to a, our walk of salvation. For we are being saved as we live in the covenant. And if we disdain it, or misunderstand it, or ignore it, we do so at our peril. You know, when you think of the mainstream Christian church over the last 2,000 years or so in secular history, you see the consequences all around us. What it means to disdain, to ignore, you know, to, to reject God's covenant. We see injustices, all sorts of injustices in the name of religion. We see anti-Semitism, hatred of the people of Jesus, hatred of the people of Abraham. We see theological confusion in many of the mainstream Christian churches. It runs the gamut from replacement theology, dispensational views, antinomian theology, distortions and deletions of scripture, such as things that happened by the German Christian movement under the Nazis in World War II. You see this sort of thing go on. How could these things have gone on if we had if the people who named themselves after Christ as Christians, if we had valued the covenant if we had appreciated what was there. God the Father, through Jesus Christ, calls individuals. He calls us to partner with him. Let's go back. I, I read this one last week, but let's take a look at this. Let's go to Matthew chapter 11, into the Gospels of Matthew 11. And verse 25. Matthew 11 and verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to babes. Yes, Father, it was well-pleasing in your sight to do this. All things were delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. That's an amazing statement when you think about it. But that's what I was speaking about last week. You might ch check into that sermon in, in John 6, 44. No one can come to me except he's drawn by the Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. Neither does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son personally chooses to reveal him. So it's not just, the way of salvation is not just at our choice. It's not just for a human being to say, well, I want to be saved. No, the Son must personally choose you. It's a miracle. It's 
It's a remarkable thought. He has a vote of confidence in you. Those of you who are listening to me, I know that, you're, that you're, 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 you love these things. Jesus Christ has personally chosen you. And he says to this in verse 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are overly burdened, and I will give you rest. He's going to give us that rest. The resting, living in that covenant. He says, verse 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. It is a process, this process of we are being saved. It's not as simplistic, just confess the name of, of Christ, make this confession, and that's all you've got to do. Get wet and you're, you're, it's, that's it. It's a lifetime. It's, it's a lifetime walk. It's a lifetime investment in developing this relationship with God the Father and Jesus Christ. Take my yoke upon you. Partner with me is what he's saying. Link up with me and learn from me. Learn from me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My burden is light. No, salvation is not a one-time magic act, you know, where you say the appropriate words and you do a little something and gobby gobby and you, there you are. You know, it's, it's not the way it works. But it's a lifelong, life-changing, everlasting covenant. Like, a, like that line that stretches to the horizon without end into the future. For us, that's where we are. With God, it also stretches out all the way to the all the way to antiquity, all the way past antiquity. It's to the vanishing point of whichever way you look at it, from God, either to the past or to the future. For us, it's to the future. That's what we're being involved in, being involved with the covenant of God. We're becoming part of the story. Those who know about God and who respond to him, well, well, God has something for you. He has some work for you and me. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2. And we'll start with verse 1. Now you were dead in trespasses and sins. Okay, that's the starting point. Each one of us, before we came to know God in any form of way, we were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you walked in times past according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working within the children of disobedience, among whom also we all once had our conduct in the lusts of our flesh, doing the things willed by the flesh and by the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as the rest of the world. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, has made us alive together with Christ. You have been saved, for you have been saved by grace. God's forgiveness. We didn't merit it. It's his mercy. It's his love. He did it. We've been saved by grace. And he has raised us up together and caused us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He's joining us to Christ Jesus. To our Lord and Master, so that in the ages that are coming he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this especially is not of your own selves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone may boast. But what? Verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto the good works that God ordained beforehand in order that we might walk in them. God has a plan. Jesus in Isaiah 42 was saying, these are the things he wants to accomplish. These are the goals of his ministry. And when we take his yoke upon us and, and partner up 
by way of the covenant, we are partnering up to help achieve the goals that Christ wants to achieve. We're signing up for this. Verse 11, therefore remember that you were once Gentiles in the flesh. Yeah, you were once, we were just like anybody else. Once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by those who are called circumcision in the flesh made by hands. And you were without Christ at that time. Without Christ. Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel from that household of servants, from that family that God had called to serve him, who he had given his everlasting covenant to and made the promises to. The rest of the world, they were alienated. They were not part of that. Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off are made near by the blood of Christ. Drink you all of this cup, for this, in this, shed of, shedding of his blood was the making, the ratifying, the enacting of the new covenant in his, in his, in his very own blood. For he is our peace. For he is our peace. Verse 18. For through him we both have direct access by one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer aliens and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are the household of God. God's household. You are being built up on the foundations of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building being conjointly fitted together is increasing into a holy temple in the Lord. God is building his church. He's building his family, the family of God. We are of his household, in whom you also are being built together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. God has given us a tremendous future. He's going to live in us. He's going to move in us. He's going to act in us. He's going to help him to accomplish his purposes and his goals in this life. The process of salvation, the deliverance from this world and from the oppression that we have in this world is only going to be achieved as we do these things in serving him. God has called you to live in the covenant with him. He has a job for you and for me to do. Next week, we're going to look into some of the lives of some of the people who are called to the covenants of, prophet, uh, covenants of promise. Those who were eager to do it, and, and some even who kind of wanted to go the other way.